happy to meet you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, um, I'm sitting with uh, two filmmakers who have uh, the two filmmakers behind The Brink, which is the uh, documentary, uh, I guess you could say, about Steve Bannon, among other things, but it's primarily about Steve Bannon. Allison Clayman, who is the director, and uh, Marie Therese uh, Girgis, did I get that right? Uh, who is uh, the producer of the film. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I guess I've seen Bannon, you know, a lot over the last few years. <laughs> you and, and me both. <laughs> well, yeah, you guys. I want to I wanna figure out how you guys insinuated, for a bit lack of words, uh, like your way, of course, to get, how, how did you get him to, although he just seems to be game. Is that fair to say? Like he's, you know, he wants to connect. Yeah. And like you guys, he seems really like he seems to have a good sense of humor, even though he's e- essentially evil. But he, but he like, but it seems like he has a self-deprecating sense of humor to some degree, and that mm-hmm. he he likes it when people uh, kibitz. And I mean, that's the thing. So there's this likable side of him which you really hate. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Well, I think the intention or, you know, why Uh do a film about him and do it in this manner, Mm -hmm. right? As Mm -hmm. a verite, you know, Mm. documentary that's trying to be in the room with him and capture, you know, not just what he does, who he works with, who meets with him, who supports him, but also kind of who he is in 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 a in a full right. portrait sure um and that that was marie trez's idea um from the beginning and i think the reason he he is being him and i think but i think the reason that he, the access is that you know was allowed is because of her i knew him so i knew him for many years he was he Going was my boss after, oh wait, uh, when, when what at what chapter in his story that's the right way history, to ask it. because in, in his film in the film chapter oh, at the end of the, the the towards the end of the film chapter of his storied career okay <laughs> He yeah. may not think it's over that part. Uh, he, the film part. <laughs> well, no, I mean I shouldn't chapter. say the end. I'm sorry. The, the business of film. He's still a filmmaker. Right, right. <laughs> um, but I wanted to just say I was talking to Susan Norgut outside, and and I I said, you know, if only he had made some great successful film back then, <laughs> he would have saved us from maybe having this particular uh, president. Right. You've so. said that before. Yeah, I've said that. Oh, you or, have. Or I think yeah. Or if he had, you know, I think um, yeah been more successful in Hollywood. Right. You know, I don't yeah. want to say because it sort of suggests that there's nothing authentic about his his uh his views and his and his work, um, but I do think that's a, you know, mm-hmm. there could okay. have been an, there could have been an alternate uh ending to the story. But uh yeah, he was he was my boss. He I was working at a film company that he took over when he raised money to buy the company. It was an art house film distribution company. What uh, what year is approximately are we talking about? Uh 2003 until 2006. So it's like not long ago. And then the, the coincidence that actually no one talks about, which is kind of interesting. So this is going to be like mm-hmm. kind of a little bit of a scoop sort of for your podcast, even though it is public record. Please. Is that he actually ended up in a complicated deal selling the company to Harvey Weinstein. That's funny. I, I thought you were, there was going to be some connection there when you started framing it like <laughs> you were. Um, so yeah, so that was quite, uh, yeah, quite, a, tw- quite a duo. Of men meeting and was he, and willing and dealing together. Was he when he was your boss? Was he kind of like like Weinsteiny? Like was he? Did he ever manifest any of those sleazy qualities? No. Like I, you know, that's the thing. It's like no. I mean, I know, can honestly could... say because I, I I I like to be fair. Sure. You know, and that was sort of. And the film is too, by the way. The film is fair. Extension. I mean, the film has a very strong point of view, but it's fair. Right. Um, that you know, I did not. I did not experience misogyny working for him. I mean, is there casual misogyny? Is he old-fashioned and outdated in some of his expressions? Sure. Okay, right. You know, did he call me girl? Honey. Did it bother me? Really? No, not honey. Okay. But no. But you know, the irony was that he was horrible. His temper was horrible. You see right. it in of the film. Course. Shocking. He was demanding. He was yeah. also quite unpredictable. He was also quite erratic in the way he managed the company. But the flip side is that I was a young woman of, you know, 30, and he basically promoted me to run a company. There were men who were older than me. There were men, you know, I, I was the most qualified, mm-hmm. but, 
that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Not I've them, certainly known progressive sure. men who are far more sexist in their practice sure. than him. Sure. Um, you know, I didn't witness or hear about anything inappropriate. I think he was um, very fair in terms of gender mm-hmm. and race and sexuality. You know, in, as a as a boss, um, but he was also a different. You know, in a political, in a different political world back then, right. um, yeah, he was pre, not in pre, the extreme far right. He was right. what I considered a moderate Republican. Right. He was like a John McCain Republican to me. He wasn't asking you about birth rates and worried about invasions and no, no. no I mean, he right. was immigration wasn't no. And the irony topic is that he was, you know, his big the big bogeyman to him was, you know, was was Russia. I mean, that's the irony. He made a Reagan documentary praising, you know, that was a hagiography right. of Reagan for for yeah. breaking the Soviet Union. So, so tell me what. The con- what, 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 so you had this idea you wanted to do a documentary. It might have even preceded Errol Morris's. Uh, it did precede like. it. Mm-hmm. We were already shooting our film for many months when Errol Morris started his. Did that? Pi- oh, that's a conversation we should have, right? Because yeah. I wonder. So he, he here's Errol Morris, a big celebrity fil- documentary filmmaker in the documentary sphere. He's a celebrity. Yeah, Not, he is. Most yeah, people outside very, of that, you know, he's very big for good reason. And so he steps in. Of course, uh, Bannon's probably very excited by that prospect. You've already started documentary. Though, yeah. He also so. didn't tell us that he was doing it. So I just found out when I was visiting him oh to talk gosh. about something in his hotel and he's like, Oh, let me show you. I got, you know, 20 minutes of the Errol Morris movie. Yeah. And I said, what are you talking? You know, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. You're, you go cold when, when at first. Oh no, I flipped out. I mean, I, oh, you did. I got. Okay. That's I, the appropriate I, I, reaction. I, mean, I, I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought it was a movie about something else because you know he's a fan of documentary, so I thought he was watching something else. But you yeah, know. so yeah. no, I got very angry and upset. And did Errol Morris know that he had already been making something? I don't so, know. Okay. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't think Errol Morris did anything. Wrong, you know. I right. mean, it was it was Bannon that just didn't tell us. No, no, I get I mean, that. We thought we had right, an exclusive. Right. No, situation. I wouldn't be surprised if Errol Morris had Errol no Morris idea. Probably didn't know. So. Yeah, no, I agree. and it was also his shoot was well, very short. I mean, right. It was a different. Well, you made a better film. Oh, I, different... I don't know. No, this Errol Morris has made, of course, a profound touchstone documentaries going back for thirty over thirty years. They're very different films. Right. Okay, so but so what? Did ha- you so, see the Untitled Amazing Jonathan documentary at Sundance this year? I wasn't. I was invited. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a documentary that was also kind of a part of the premise was making a film and then uh, an Academy Award winning mm-hmm. filmmaker producer allegedly uh, also making a movie, and I've, I I uh, watched that and I had a lot of uh, I felt a lot of camaraderie with that part of the story. Was this a, this a narrative? Is that what you're saying? Was it, no, it's a documentary. Oh, it's a documentary? Yeah. What was it called again? The Untitled Amazing Jonathan documentary about, do you remember the mu- magician Amazing Jonathan who he kind of had like a shticky mm-hmm. m- magic act um, and yeah, over the what, course like of the movie. Like more than David Copperfield? Or? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess all magic is shtick, but it's, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, anyway, that was, it was really funny mm-hmm. yeah, and when people were like, you should go see it. So. so you had it in your head. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, I'm largely talking to Marie, but I, I, I'm just curious about what that initial. I mean, obviously you were able to get to him because he knew you and obviously respected you. And so, so do, do, what did he? What was his reaction when you said you wanted to do a documentary? Is, said, or did, is that how you approached him? Yeah, I mean, I had approached him before that with just sort of random, very angry emails and text messages about what he was doing, what he had been doing. Um, and uh, since after since he after he joined the Trump campaign. campaign, right? So I hadn't been in touch with him. I basically just started getting back in touch with him, sending him fairly aggressive, angry messages. But he responded, um, and he responded politely and you know civilly. Sometimes made a joke. So I knew that I had there was this access, and I knew that for whatever reasons, you know, he still wanted to talk to me, and uh-huh. he still liked me. Um, and so then when I I had the idea for a number of reasons, which I won't go into right now, but to make a documentary about him. Right. It wasn't, just to be clear, it wasn't because I could. There, there were real things that I was seeing and observing. And, sure. And, um, but anyway, I asked Not him. Not that just because you could isn't a legitimate and no, good but, reason to no, do it. If but I had I mean, access I think to Steve for, Bannon, I'd do it. Just yeah, but I think for both that. of us, and Allison can talk more about this too, I think it's important for her too, there... You know, there there are many. I think there are reasons not to make a documentary about Steve Bannon if you don't have, if you're not coming, if your approach isn't the right one, if you're not coming Mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. the right place. So, Mm -hmm. in any case, I asked him. um, I emailed him. He was still in the White House, actually, and uh, he said the first the first response was, "No way, you'll destroy me." 
And then um, I was just, that a joke? I mean, he's always humorous, Sounds but like no, it. I think yeah. he, it wasn't really a joke because he knew. I mean, I had been sending him hate mail basically for months because at that point. He, because he aligned himself with uh, the... Yes, because he knew what I thought about jackass. his politics at that point. He knew okay. what I thought about what I felt about Trump. I, he knew what I felt about the policies that okay. he was promoting, the travel ban, things like that. And it like was that. so the nature of your emails initially were, what, what are you doing? What, yeah, what, what I mean, are you just, thinking? I'm horrified. I right. can't believe it. I'm right. so disappointed. Why are you right. doing this? I really this? respected this you. you. Yeah, you okay, know, good. I thought you were better than, into, better than this. Mm. This is disgusting. Okay. I mean, and worse. But Okay, so you decided to do this, and then you got him his... He his... said no a few times. Oh. And then like, he... Like you go to the rabbi. Right? Yeah, he said no, yeah, exactly. like the first three times. Yeah. And then I just kind of kept asking. Like, I would randomly just ask another couple of weeks later. And, um, you wrote one and he, down? And then he just said, one day he just said yes. And he was still in the White House, so that was kind of crazy. But he said yes. He said, Perfect, though. I'll do it. Mm. And then I had where, to... Where yeah, was this? In the, the just in the quick in the timeline of, the, of it his, was his April, time. April, like May of, t- May of 2017 uh-huh. around. Okay. And then it just took me a little while to was, see him because I wanted to see him before I kind of subjected a filmmaker to him because yeah. I didn't know what he was like anymore. You know, I hadn't really been in regular touch with him for years. I didn't know if had he lost a sense of humor because, you know, I was just seeing this depiction. Right. right. Was he still, did he still have the ability to have any self-deprecating here or self-awareness? I yeah. mean, was he just like right. a which crazed is, lunatic complete, 24 hours a day? Right. Which in is which the case, complete like, opposite of Trump. You yeah. Know, has no I don't self. think you could actually make, honestly, I don't think right. you could make a very interesting documentary about Trump I, with Trump right. as the central figure. No, in five minutes it would just yeah. be. Yeah. So, just, and I did always say that, you know, yeah. when she called me and mm-hmm. said, you know, this, proposed this project i immediately said yes and i think if she had called and said it about trump i would have immediately said no (laughs) like oh really yeah i don't think i I have access to trump do you want to make a documentary about him well i guess i i i I definitely would rather let's say it wouldn't be an immediate yes he's agreed not to put his hands on you yeah i mean for a lot of reasons i Mm -hmm. i uh i think bannon is a more More compelling character okay so you saw the Ai Weiwei documentary and you thought Allison... I worked Allison... with Allison oh, okay. before on a short film oh, which called one? The 100-Year Show, which um, if anyone listening has not seen, I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix. It's 20, how many minutes? Like 25 minutes. 25 minutes. So I'd worked with her in, in less, not as close a capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just blown away by the film and not just the film, but, uh, and I'm not just saying this because she's sitting here, but Allison is probably one of the most kind of emotionally intelligent, socially intelligent filmmakers I've ever worked with. Mm. Both, yeah, I, you I know, picked up on that immediately. In 20 years, uh-huh. she is. And so I felt, and it was just instinctive. I mean, I didn't like go through a list of filmmakers in my head. It was yeah. just an instinct. And it was, right. the instinct was, you know, Allison is extremely talented creatively. Like, I think of Allison as an artist. A lot of documentary filmmakers are sort of journalists. I think mm-hmm. Allison has journalistic skills, but she's also an artist and she has an artistic temperament, which I think was I wanted a good film. But also, you know, there needed it needed to be somebody who could really as you used the word insinuate herself or mm-hmm. himself right. um, in, in into, a positive way in, in a positive way yeah. into this world that was extremely different from mm-hmm. the world of most documentary filmmakers and also Bannon's not an idiot he's a very smart man he's very media savvy he's mm-hmm. very savvy about the film business he's very so you know it, it also needed to be someone who would also be able to kind of read him mm-hmm. would be able to figure him out mm-hmm. you know fairly you know she gave him a long chance but I mean to actually kind of read him you know not necessarily be seduced by him as I think some other lots of people are right and um, yeah. and that also the last thing I want to say and I do think it's a it's a th- it's a real thing especially given that she's a woman and a young woman is that she has the guts to do this I mean there you know it took guts not just to take this on but then to go and follow him for a year all across the world to be, you know, with a group of basically only men and men, you know, with, she can talk about this, but with whom, you know, she, who, when you're around it, it's hard if you don't share those politics, I'll just put it that way. Mm. It can be, it can be really tough. So anyway, I just, I knew she had every single, or I, I've believed that she had every single quality. And, and then I could, I was only just like blown away when I actually saw, you know, what she put together. So it exceeded any hope that I had, but, um, Mm -hmm. I, there was no, there was really no one else I felt could do this film. How tough was it, Allison? Uh, was it uh, just oppressive over time? It, yeah, I think it was tough in all the ways. You know, both, um, you know, the best way to get the the kind of access and the feeling that I had. You know, it was best to be a you know one person crew. Um, he operates at, in a very 
scattered last minute disorganized manner so you don't really mm-hmm. you know you, you don't get to plan much in verite filmmaking but this was the most like fly by the seat of your pants ever so he just you just laved him up and then yeah it was just the same as you know in other projects the goal of every day is you know, do you get the microphone on? You know, can you get oh, in the, the room? Rain. Can you Soon get enough, him to wear the microphone? Yeah, don't and, miss any good stuff and yeah, all that, right? And, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, and the access was tough also because I was interested in the full picture, not, yeah. you know, yeah, it, it isn't really like a psychological portrait, although I think it, it's, 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 it's I think inevitably it, part I think of it. it gives though. You yeah. enough, I think it gives you enough because the whole project is to... Uh, observe him closely and have a critical eye so I do think the audience is on that journey but you know I didn't want to just be in a room with him like I wanted to have action I wanted him to interact with you know uh, donors supporters you know other politicians and so that's also very hard to you know get the cooperation of everyone and you know just getting the access you know so all those things are hard and yes psychologically I mean it was like listening to I could finish his sentences and when it when it came to interviews and stump speech material mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean i i listened to him well, how many times you say the the thorn between two the, rose, <laughs> the, the, the she's the rose between two thorns i mean you played that up obviously because <laughs> to i assume illustrate the script that he goes by it's all for show Right? Yeah, I think that's like one of the... Uh, explain what I just referred to because I didn't say the whole thing. But yeah, this was something... Uh, for in, photo ops. Yeah, in early in the film, you see him do photo photo lines basically at Republican uh, fundraiser events and it always blew my mind. I mean, to me, there's so much that... So many reasons why I put that in the, in mm. the film, but, <laughs> you know, because it really was always still kind of shocking to me that he would go places and people lined up to take a photo with him, which just speaks to the world that I come from where I don't think anybody would want to post a picture with him on their Facebook page. And, you know, it's a reminder that he has devotees or people who, you know, just aren't that critical of him and are excited to have a photo with a Trump surrogate or someone who is famous. Right. Yeah. But he, you know, he's very good at retail politics. He understands the value of that. And he has, uh, he's actually probably better on a one-on-one uh, level than he is as a public speaker and so you know his glad handing and game is top notch although kind of old, old fashioned and every time uh, but bizarrely to me every time there was a you know a group that came up if there was a man and a woman he would always say oh we have to get you in the middle here a rose between two thorns <laughs> and you get the same oh me oh you know it was like yeah. always it, it but you know but it's a, it's, it's, it, it was this very repetitive thing and right. and we also used it as a callback you know and also we wanted to have moments of levity i knew from the first meeting with him i was like oh this movie's going to be funny too yes yeah, and also one of the devices that I think was available to us through Verite Film was um, repetition, right? And so we it serves as a callback later in the movie too, where right. Right. Um, yes, you know, where he's right. still doing the same. He has his, still has, has his same routine, but the you know the, the next time you hear it is mm-hmm. you know in the midst of the midterms, and the last time is uh, the week of the Pittsburgh shooting, and I think then it. It lets it kind of take on the a different feeling. The of the, yeah, yeah. The, the synagogue shooting. Yeah. And it kind of has a more eerie tone. And to me, it shows kind of the way that the callous way he can react to events. And, you know, he can be outraged if it fits his narrative. And if not, he just goes about his business. Mm. So the film follows him through a period of how long? Like, essentially when he's... from start to finish. 13, okay. It's basically uh, the year out of the White House. Right. You know, but if I were to say... Or somebody says, "What's who's the opposite of Steve Bannon?" I would probably say Ai Weiwei, mm-hmm. <laughs> because yeah. you can't have two more polar opposite people. Or their circumstances. You have one who is, in a way, the oppressor. He is uh, about uh, what's the term, uh, realpolitik, or about uh, manifest destiny. That mm-hmm. kind of, you know, mm-hmm. there is that. He seems to be right out of that playbook. And yeah. then you have Ai Weiwei, who is on the other side of that. You know, always dodging. And, you know, one step ahead of the oppressor, which is the Chinese government. Yeah. And, uh, and so... 
And what did, not to mention ideologically. I right. mean, look at what Ai Weiwei's, you know, for in his own art and film in the last couple of years, you know, the ref, global refugee crisis it's and urging point. people to yes. look at it through right. a lens of shared humanity and compassion. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, you couldn't write a better opposing view to mm -hmm. how Bannon views the issue of uh, global refugee crisis. He wants to build walls, close borders. It's not about compassion for people. Um, and uh, he, right now, though, this year, I feel like it's watching him try to frame it as if it's for someone's benefit. It's for the, you know, the citizenry and, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I, I uh, yeah, it, um, it, it, that's, can show you I'm already getting like, you know, it, it, it does make me upset. So following Ai Weiwei, I think there are a lot of the same challenges and they're both great personalities. There, there are things I can say that, you know, um, about the experience that one was, you know, following Iowa was a good training ground for, hmm. for doing this. But hmm. I would say, hmm. uh, it was like following someone who you shared a lot of their values and someone who you shared almost none. And, and, and I think, who, which, <laughs> yeah. Around, and, and I think, um, yeah. but I think Couldn't that resist. that, but yet I still think you brought, mm -hmm. I still think you brought your, the same kind of the same kind of like emotional intelligence and sort of yeah. and skepti fair and fairness skepticism. and skepticism yeah. to both. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. what, you know, I know, I know yeah. you've said that, and I believe you because I know you actually, you know, it's the truth I'm, that you didn't. Um, well, yes, you knew that you didn't agree with Bannon's side of the aisle and his politics. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, didn't kind of, and, and that's also something I appreciated that, you know, you, 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 you were kind of wanting to study him. Right. And I'm sure you studied Ai Weiwei too. Right. So yeah, there is and a, I always an open-mindedness. Mm -hmm. I always said, you know, with Weiwei too, when I first got to know him, I also didn't know that much about him and experienced it all. And I always said, you know, if he's kind of a phony, if he's kind of like a showman and a persona, right. uh, his company is called fake, you know, it's a, it's like a fake is the name of his, you know, fuck, uh, like studio, oh. his, you know, and he, he loves to play with fake and real. He's very playful and, mm -hmm. and, and, um, all these things that yeah, could, we know point, is all fake that could point to something else. So I, right. I, but I felt the movie I made, yeah. I think shows way, way having genuine concern, you know, a, a genuine, beliefs and concerns because I spent three years following wow. him and that is what I what did determined. He, mm -hmm. What did he, what did I Weiwei make of, of the, of the documentary? I, I just, just so he's since gonna, we're talking. Oh, of, of Never Sorry? Of the one about, well, I want to ask him, well, I want to ask about both Bannon. What did yeah. Bannon make of I Weiwei? <laughs> <laughs> no. Did he? Well, did Bannon see your earlier document? Did he? Did he, did he want to, to see it? I don't think he had seen it originally. Okay. Um, I mean, no, no, I was no. really talking it up, right? Um, and I and you know he likes prestigious things, right? And he likes you and know. she's an award winning documentary yeah, filmmaker, yeah, and, and also that, like a very his, famous Chinese, you know, the most famous Chinese right, artist in the world, right? Both famous that's very in the Trumpian. World. Yeah. Sounding way but that's a fr but he likes that. Yeah. So I don't know well, if he ever doesn't. watched yeah. it. But he would introduce me to people for the first probably like eight months. It would be like as, this a, Allison, as the rose. She in made. The yeah, no, she made. She made the movie about the Chinese. Well, you tell them the Chinese artist, the Chinese <laughs> artist. And then there was a day, honestly, that's like when you can't remember people's names when you're introducing them. Well, yeah. you two introduce each yeah. other uh, to each other because you can't remember their names. And then it was like honestly, yeah. I felt like it was around um, the Venice Film Festival when he was you know coming out for you know in in theory to be available to press about another film maybe i kind of felt like he had studied up because it was around that time mm -hmm. suddenly he could say ai Weiwei and ai Weiwei never sorry and i think maybe he like watched it although i do know that the people that work for him watched it because yeah. they all kind of oh yeah they all watched it because they would mention it oh yeah. that's nice what did ai Weiwei make of i just i'm sorry these are yeah. my cur just because i'm of a fan of the documentary myself yeah. and i didn't get a chance to i think i was trying to i i remember trying to figure that out and meet with you during the making of that or yeah. after that film but I didn't didn't happen so what do I would make of the of uh, Never Sorry of Never Sorry um, it was great it's kind of similar because it was mm -hmm. he wasn't allowed to leave the country that he was for uh, at least two years they kept his passport after he was released from detention mm. um, and we uh, so we had my I was already kind of publicly speaking out doing TV appearances speaking about him while he was detained so we didn't feel like it was safe for me to bring the film there so my uh, producer brought it showed him a you know a, a almost locked cut 
Mm -hmm. Um, he watched the whole thing and he sent me a video message and he was like, you could see the shock. I think it's weird to see a movie about yourself, especially after covering such a long period of time. Yes. But he, um, you know, he didn't ask to change a single thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and he just said, wow. I mean, it wasn't an option, but, but you they're can sensitive, ask. and there's also it is a, such a sensitive. Yeah, and thing. in truth, uh, if he had said there was something for a safety reason, right, which was course. why right. we felt like we needed the time yeah. to get him to see the film, right, right. it was a legitimate concern. And he, you know, but but also just uh, you know spiritually and creatively, he didn't have any issues, and he was very supportive. And then when the movie started to come out, but mm -hmm. but then it was sort of he had bigger. <laughs> like issues in his right. life and he didn't Skype into Sundance. He didn't feel comfortable for safety reasons. But I have to say once the movie became what, what I think it was in for him, it's a force in the world that introduced so many people to him. That's right. And, um, it mean like it became a thing where his, as I, cause I'm still in, like close with him or certainly in touch with him and see him whenever, oh, okay. whenever we can see each other. And, it just continues, I think, to be a force um, yeah. for good in his life, and he and he was just so amazed at how powerful it was and how it reached so many people. Yeah, it so certainly did. That's been a nice feeling. It's interesting. They're there's uh, they're neck and neck. I weigh and Steve Bannon are neck and neck with uh, documentaries about them. Like, cause uh, right there's there was another yeah. at least one other documentary yeah, about I weigh case came out. Um, that was a different filmmaker though. Yeah, right? a you different didn't do filmmaker, that. and he and he started filming just as I was finishing. Oh really? And when we and we met uh, Andreas. <laughs> a little bit better and, than and yours. He, and he's great. Well, and it was a similar style too, because it was he was yeah. also a single you know person shooter director. Right. Um. But so he basically. But he understood. So first of all, he had been, as, as he told me, he had been writing Wei Wei for like the last two years asking to do this film. And so he, when he showed up, he was like, oh, it's too bad. Like, clearly you've already been doing this for two years. So he didn't try to compete in terms of coming out. And he then followed, yes. you know, the, his story picks up where mine leaves off. Um, so yeah, there, it, but it's, it's like kind of different than the <laughs> guy that makes the cheat gets hired after, you know, the big yeah. successful Hollywood movie. And then they, Get a second-rate director to do the no. But I don't mean secondary. Sometimes yeah. it's actually a very and famous he, second director. But they always get like you know Amityville Horror too. You know, it's not <laughs> quite has the glamour of the original. He was a more experienced machine. filmmaker. You know, he had uh, made other documentaries. Gotcha. Um, and uh, you know, for me, that was my yeah. debut. So, right. Uh, but but he understood. I was at first worried. Oh, is he going to try to come up out with something and beat us? Or I don't know. And hmm. but he was like, you know, and he said it and he meant it. He was like, how could I? You know, I would have been pretty crummy. <laughs> yeah. Real quick. Because I know we're going to chase out. Uh, and Banna, did he? Did, what did he think of? Was he at the premiere? No. Okay. He wasn't at the premiere. Okay. Um, but but what I, did I, he... I screened it for him before. Where did you do uh, that? The premiere at his house. Mm -hmm. um, it, was but it was the. It was like the basically the final version. There were just like little tweaks that we made of afterwards. Course. Yeah. Uh, I think similarly, probably to Ai Weiwei, it was okay. a very strange thing to watch yourself. Uh, you know, for 90 minutes yeah. when you've been filmed for a year, he's not used to it. He's not, he wasn't a celebrity. So he was pretty quiet most of the time. Um, you know, I think he had some concerns about his appearance, not the way Alice had depicted of him, course. but just, you know, it's right. weird and he yeah. felt like, a, yeah. um, but I, I don't know if he was intentionally kind of, you know, holding his cards close to the vest or if it was just that he was like genuinely kind of didn't know what to make of it. Right. But, um, since then, you know, I, since then, he's basically stopped talking to me yeah. uh, since the reviews came out. So, um, oh, really? Yeah. So, you know, be, people can extrapolate. People can extrapolate from that what they will. Um, if that expresses what he feels about the film, yeah. or not. I well, have my opinion about that, but uh, you know, that's that was the experience. The Brink opens in New York City, LA, and Washington D.C. on March 29th, uh, and then it'll go wide, I'm, I'm na 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 nationwide, uh, no doubt. Uh, thank you, Allison and Marie. I had tons, tons more to ask you. I mean, but you know, there, it's an endless thing. But uh, obviously, people should just go and see the film because it's 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 highly rewarding and thank you so much yeah, yeah this has been great you. let's do it again yeah, yeah okay. keep talking <laughs> thanks guys